At the end of April, Jody and I took a little weekend road trip with her parents. We wanted to let loose and hear some good music, so we headed down to Memphis. If you head down 55 from St. Louis, Memphis is the next big city on the Mississippi. The Mississippi River's been a major cultural hub since way before any Europeans ever showed up. And you can follow the roots of American music down the river all the way to New Orleans where jazz was first born. We stayed on Mud Island at the north end of Harbor Town, where the carefully planned streets and neatly preened row houses make you feel like you're on some kind of movie set. Everything has this facade of history while also being brand new. It's kind of weird. But it was a nice place to stay. We settled in and got Coco all set up while we waited for her parents to show up. We got a feel for the house we'd be staying in. It was pretty nice. And most importantly for us, very dog friendly. Now the first thing on your mind after a road trip is getting some food in your face. And Memphis is known for their dry rub barbecue, so we headed downtown to find some. We found a little spot called Central Barbecue that had good reviews from the locals online. The barbecue did not disappoint and good times were had. With some food in our bellies, we started things off with a relaxing drive through Elmwood Cemetery. Elmwood's a beautiful park and a good place to get a feel for the history of Memphis. The cemetery dates all the way back to 1852. It was originally designed to be a park where families could get together and spend time eating a picnic and chilling with their dead relatives. Quite a few of the sites contain families going back over a century. These days it's a very relaxing place to stroll around and just think about life. Elmwood's home to tombstones of every class, from towering ornate monuments to endless rows of unmarked graves. The Civil War in the 1860s and the Yellow Fever outbreak in the 1870s quickly filled the ranks of the unmarked. Prominent figures from the history of Memphis aren't hard to find either. Over a thousand Confederate soldiers from all over Tennessee and up and down the Mississippi are buried here. And the yellow fever was apparently so bad in Memphis that it bankrupted the city itself. Looks like a mausoleum, but I don't know. Well, cemeteries are a bit morbid for sure, but they're also quite literally full of history. One of the only ways we live on after our bodies have died is in the memory of those who follow. And taking some time to reflect on those who shaped our history gives us a feeling of respect and reverence for our own lives. A walk among the departed is a sure way to get a clear focus on your own limited future. It forces you to reflect on what you're doing with the time you have. So next we headed a little outside downtown to see another more famous side of Memphis' history. Of all the things that Memphis is known for, it is most known for its musical heritage. Back in the day, the city attracted blues greats from up and down the Mississippi. Guys like Howlin' Wolf, Ike Turner, and B.B. King. Back in the 40s, Memphis was the place to go to hear the electric blues. And while the blues was dominating the streets, the mainstream was still focused on country music or occasionally on more accessible black music like jazz and swing. But the blues continued to evolve and take over the youth culture. 
In the late 40s, it got infused with jazz drums, gospel vocals, and swing dance energy, and it became this whole new thing called rhythm and blues. It was purpose-built to make you move your ass and even more popular with the kids. Meanwhile, country music still considered drums to be the devil. But there was one studio in the city actively seeking out R&B artists. It was a little place on Union Street called the Memphis Recording Service. These days they call it Sun Studio. I was really looking forward to this part of our trip. Being myself a musician into recording, I was excited to tour a studio with such a cool history. A lot of shit got started in this place and I could only hope some of that energy and inspiration might still be hanging around. We went inside and hung out in the gift shop a little bit while we waited for the tour to start. We got a little coffee and started getting excited. Soon we'd be hanging out in the room where Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, Howlin' Wolf, Carl Perkins, and endless others used to do their thing. After checking out the memorabilia and crap all over the walls and slamming our coffees down, we headed back to learn more about the birthplace of rock and roll. Sun's main claim to being the birthplace of rock and roll comes from the discovery of Elvis Presley. The owner, Sam Phillips, promoted many blues and R&B legends, but he was always on the prowl for acts that could appeal to white audiences. He was quoted as saying, if I could find a white man who had the Negro sound, I could make a billion dollars. So next we headed downstairs to see the real studio. Sam Phillips wasn't around, and so his receptionist, Marion Kesker, made the first recording of Elvis. If you have any idea how complex 50-0 recording equipment was, you'd agree receptionist wasn't really a fair job title. And that brings us to the recording room. Many early rock legends got their start jamming out in this room. Johnny Cash used to come in here and listen to Carl Perkins record. It's a surprisingly small room with uninspiring acoustics, but everything is soaked with years of jam sessions. If you're wondering, that looks like sweat, beer, and cigarette burns. If you take the tour, they actually pass around some genuine Elvis spit on the last remaining microphone from the studio's early days, you know, if that's what you're into. Jerry Lee Lewis used to sit at this piano and record with whoever happened to be around that day. Larry Mullen left his drum kit here after recording the U2 classic Rattle and Hum. It's easy to imagine sitting around a room like this all day with the tape rolling, playing every song you know and waiting for something special to happen. I really enjoyed soaking it all in and maybe a little people watching. As the sun went down, we were all in a musical mood now, so we decided to go catch some live music. We wanted to let loose and have a few drinks, so we took an Uber back towards downtown. We started the night in Overton Square, where there's a good selection of great restaurants. The weather was perfect that night, so we strolled around the square a little while Jody read the entire internet review section. We decided to head into a place called Bosco's to grab a bite to eat and ease into the evening. We sat out on the patio and shared some appetizers and had a few beers. The food was fantastic and the weather couldn't have been nicer. Next on the agenda, find some live music. 
And if there's one place in Memphis known for its live music, it's Beale Street. They've apparently put up a few signs over the years in case you weren't aware that this was the place to be. Beale Street reminded us a lot of Music Row in Nashville, but with a heavy police presence and a cover charge at every door. We prefer the two drink minimum approach that places like Frenchman Street have where you can hear a lot more music in a night. We decided to check the tap room because we could hear some laid back blues happening inside. It was a dive, which is to say exactly what we were looking for. The band was called Cowboy Neil and the Trump Tight Band. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but they had the bluesy sound we were looking for. Jody requested something funky and they busted out some classic Stevie Wonder. The girls got their dance on and we all had a good time. I'm sure the tap room is about as close as you're going to get to the feeling of Beale Street and its Haiti. But like most cultural centers in America, it's just an echo of what it once was. A cultural time capsule. Now don't get me wrong, we live in the most amazing times today with more culture than you could ever want right at your fingertips. But it's just different. It's happening on the internet, in our minds, on our phones. You don't see it in the streets the way that you used to. I don't personally know what to make of it, but I do think it's valuable to dig into our cultural roots. Maybe we do end up longing for a time past, of course, overlooking the nasty side of life back then. And that's the thing. Culture today isn't as revolutionary because most of the revolutions that needed to happen have already happened. And despite what the news says, the world is a better, safer place with more opportunity than ever before. Maybe taking culture back to the streets will be the next revolution once we're done living out these virtual lives. Oh yeah, it's mad bedtime for him. He is passing the fuck out.